Hi. Thanks for taking some of your lunch time. Um, it's a real pleasure to come and talk to you all. I just like to start basically just to understand maybe just what different parts of the organisation you're from. So I don't know, like maybe people could just kind of shout out. I don't know different. You're the you're the data science. Anyone else from data science? Okay, data science. Anyone? What other what other sections? Do you want? Huh? Sales and marketing. Sales and marketing. Who's from sales and marketing? You guys, great. Okay. Product revenue. Product revenue. Okay, no, great. No, no, just, yeah. Okay. We don't bring it in. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? What other? Avionics. Avionics. Great. Okay. Avionics over there. Right. Okay. I remember uh -huh. doing panel. Anyone else? Any other sections that haven't been covered yet? Insights. Insights? Anybody else from Insights? <laughs> yeah, okay. Any, any, come, come, come on, come on. You guys, there's some, if there's, there's another chair if you want to sit. I think there's a couple of chairs here if you want to feel comfortable. So you don't feel like you're kind of like... I know it stops you having an early exit if I turn out to be less interesting than you thought, but it's, it's okay. Um, so, okay, it's really great to have everyone here. Um, I do want it to be quite interactive. If you want to interrupt at any point, that's fine. It's also going to be reasonably, reasonably short. Um, so don't worry, I'm sure you've all got, because I know how busy people are nowadays, no doubt here. So, um, I'm going to start off, and how do I just, I just kind of advance the slides this way, right? Great, there's nothing fancy that I need to do. Wonderful. So, basically, as Hugo said, just give you a little bit of context. There's two purposes. It's like, what's the value of this talk, I hope, to you? So, one is... Uh, I, I actually started, I think, with, uh, I, I met Steve about a year and a bit ago, and I came in and did some work, actually, on your, on Black Swan strategy initially. Uh, and then about six, you know, when I finished that, we were saying, what do you do? And kind of Steve said, well, why don't you go out, you know, one of the challenges is conveying the value of what you do. One of the things I'd seen actually looking at the strategy and doing that work was that it's often, it's often kind of harder than it should be to articulate to potential clients or just people out there what the value of this work is and how it kind of works right i mean i think in particular one of the things i'd go on about is this kind of like there's a lot of this big kind of i don't like the term big data very much in fact you can read a blog a lot a post by me many years ago on the guardian saying why i didn't like big data but my point is that people have heard big data right in companies and they've heard this magic thing but often i think sometimes even now they've sort of had this experience that how does it actually turn into tangible business value like there's all this like data stuff but then it doesn't actually address the problem they necessarily have and I think one of the things actually that's really special about Black Swan, uh, in my experience, I've done stuff across the sector for 15 years, is that really good connection between like knowing the tech stuff, knowing data, but really applying it to things that are actually going to make a difference to somebody. Actually understanding business problems, right? Uh, rather than just coming in like you've got your incredibly fancy technology and you know it's going to save the world and cost a lot of money, right? You know, <laughs> that's what companies, I think. And so part of it that was is that companies are challenged in that. Like, how is data actually going to make a difference? Um, and so that's what this talk was kind of set up as, was a way to introduce some companies and talk through with them where, what, is, what, is, what is the data difference? Why can it make a difference? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out, I'll just tell you a tiny bit more about me before I begin, which is, so I grew up on a farm in Northamptonshire. I don't know, who's heard of Peterborough here? They want hope. Okay, if you heard of Peterborough. I, I grew up near Peterborough on a farm. Uh, I had seven dogs and three cats when I was a kid. About 150 cattle, 700 sheep means you work every day of the year. It's one of the things I learned about farming, <laughs> um, including Christmas, especially Christmas, because no one else works on Christmas. And I, but I ended up in technology, right? Which the result, my mother, who's the farmer, still doesn't understand what I do. And particularly, I worked in like digital policy and data. I helped build, for example, a load of open data portals around the world. Like some of you may have scraped data from da open data portals like data.gov UK or data.gov or the National Statistical Office. And I helped build those sites and do open data policy and various other stuff. And so I really ended up, I've been fascinated and passionate about how we can use digital technology to make a better world, in particular, answer questions. Because um, I was incredibly curious as a kid and today. And so I want to start, though, with a story, which is when I was, uh, when I was 17 years old, I applied to university and I applied to among other places I applied to Cambridge. And I really wanted to go to Cambridge. And um, I remember coming back and it was about, I think the, about the 3rd of January, uh, I'd gone away uh, actually with my girlfriend on this kind of trip. Um, and I came by the 3rd of January and I was met my father and he had this really grim expression on his face. But I didn't know whether that meant anything because my father generally had quite a grim expression on his face. Um, but 
you know, he, he said, I've got this envelope for you. And as usual, so for my father, he'd opened the envelope, even though it was addressed to me. Um, and it was the letter from Cambridge. And it began with those words you generally don't want to read, which say, you know, we're sorry to, you know, thank you so much for applying, but we're sorry to inform you that we're not going to offer you a place to read mathematics. And I was really kind of, you know, among other things, I think I really kind of, I really thought I would go there. Like I'd been told my teachers I was good enough. And there was suddenly this crushing moment um, that I wasn't going to get in. And then about a week later, this kind of ray of hope came. They sent me a second letter saying, well, we're not accepting you, but we have put you in this thing called the pool. For those of you, Cambridge has this weird system where some people, they don't accept the individual colleges because they don't have a centralized admission system. It's done at each college. They put some of the people in the central pool and some colleges that didn't have enough people might take you. And I was lucky enough to get this other offer from another college who said, well, if I got these, I had to get these especially high grade stuff, I would be allowed in, right? And I got those grades. I went to Cambridge and I read mathematics. And the thing was that um, the Cambridge, the college I'd applied to, you may know, it's called Trinity. It's the one which is in, you know, in the films. They run, they run around Great Court in the movie Char Chariots of Fire. That's college. It's the best college for doing mathematics. And at the end, I graduated after three years. And they actually rank you when you do mathematics. They rank you in order. It's supposed to be secret, but it kind of, the, the list gets kind of somehow shared. I don't know quite how. Uh, around. And so I knew that I eventually came fifth in the tripos. I came number five out of 230, 35 people in the tripos. And that meant I beat be all the two people who'd gone to Trinity uh, at the end, which I was very satisfied about. Um, that, you know, they'd made this big mistake because it still rankled with me. And the thing was, though, I kind of wanted, like, I'd come that, you know, in the end, they take, they took 35 people and I built, be all but two of them. One per, the Trinity normally has the person who always comes top in the tripos. And they did that year as well. Um, now, the thing was, right, you know, and this, the thing was that 10 years later, I was a fellow at Cambridge Economics. So I'd gone on and I'd become an academic. And I was suddenly on the other side of the table. I suddenly had 17-year-olds come in for 30 minutes with me. I'd read their transcript. I'd read their personal statement. I don't know any of you here who did apply to university in the UK will remember you maybe had to write this thing. And then I would interview them for about 20 to 30 minutes, and I have to make a decision on their future. And two thirds of them, I would have to reject. About, we took one in three at the college I was at, and in general, that was the acceptance ratio. And I just remembered like how wrong I felt it had gone. And I also remembered very clearly, it had gone wrong in the interview. I'd gone into this interview room, they'd asked me to factor some factorial, and I'd got it, I'd screwed it up. You know, I could really remember, uh, you know, you let you, when you leave the interview room, and you just like, you just know, oh my God, like I know how to do that. How can I have done that wrong? Has anyone ever had like a job interview like that? Yeah, or any other thing? It was just like, what did I do? And I could just, you know, I could just see my chances slipping away in that moment. You know, I never know what made the decision, but that was it. And there were that, you know, people like, there are people who freeze up. There are people, you know, like how do you know in that 30 minutes what they're going to be like for three years? And so I got really curious. You know, I even asked in Cambridge, I went around and said, well, do we have any statistics? Like, do we, do we like, like, you know, do we have any data, for example, on the people we accepted, you know, or even people we pulled? Because that would be a nice sample, these people who were almost rejected, but who made it. Like, do we have anything that would tell us how reliable our system is? The answer was no. There was no data at all on like, or even people, how they were rated, because you kind of rated people and you accepted them. Like, how do they do when their degree at three years later? There was no data. So I kind of got interested in this, how do we make decisions? Like this is really, this was very close to having a very major effect on my life, if you like. And it certainly had major effects on people's, other people's lives that I made decisions about. So I'm kind of fascinated by that. And I, I wasn't alone. There, for example, people have thought about this for a while. So these guys, there's, a, there's something called the Oregon Research Institute and a guy called Lou Goldberg. And he asked this question, and he asked it about a whole bunch of areas. He didn't just ask it about admissions, for example. He also said, uh, what about admissions to a psychiatric hospital? That seems actually a bigger deal than getting accepted to university. Like, do you get put in a mental institution or do you not? Do you get let out of a mental institution or not? And how good are psychiatrists at making this diagnosis? Or, for example, when they let you out, how good are they at predicting whether you'll come back, you know, or that you'll have a psychotic episode? Uh, or what about, what about, Something that we all, you know, or like health. What about doctors? So let's say a doctor's got a looking at your cancer scan. How good is the doctor about saying, oh, yeah, it's cancer or it's no, no, you're fine. How reliable are doctors at these kind of things? And he wanted, he wanted not really so much to evaluate how good he was. 
He just wanted to see how you could model it. He was psychologically interested. And of course, it's a very complicated process, right? Um, so he, you know, in each area, there's loads of factors you take into account. Uh, just think of these students I interviewed. They have their transcript. You know, they have the books they've read. They have the stuff they tell me in the interview, etc. They've got the school they went to. And he looked at, looked at a bunch of areas, but what he looked at was cancer. And he went, he and his colleagues at Oregon went down to the major Oregon uh, kind of teaching hospital and said, okay, give us your best oncologists and let's, we'd like them to explain, I'm not even evaluating, just explain how do they diagnose a cancer scan, right? Because you've got this x-ray of your stomach and there's an ulcer. And the question is, is that that ulcer cancer? Is it benign tumor or is it not, is it a cancerous tumor? And they said, oh yeah, absolutely, we can explain how we do it. There's seven factors we look at. We look at how big the cancer is. We look at whether it's been growing. We look at whether the edges of it are rough or smooth. And there's about four other factors we look at. He's like, great. Okay, he's like, well, you know. And they, and they also said, you know, it's, it's not simple. You know, if the cancer's big and it's got rough edges, that means something different from if it's small and it's got rough edges. You know, those, it's the complex interactions between different variables here. So he's like, well, God, this is going to be, I mean, this is going to be years of research work here to understand this process, which is great. You know, that's what he wanted. And he said, but let me just start. I'm one of those guys. I like to keep it simple. Keep it, has anyone heard that phrase, keep it simple, stupid? The great, great, great piece of advice for all software engineering in the world. Um, and so he was like that. He said, so the simplest model, what's the simplest model you could do with seven factors? Anyone here? What data scientists among us? Huh? What could you do? You've got seven factors that might be, you know, that can be like more or less that you could be in the decision of whether something's cancerous or not. What could you just, what's the simplest model you could build? You, that wouldn't be, the, well, decision tree, but even simpler would just be to add them up and weight them, like just give each one a, an equal weighting and just sum them up. Like the factors which are more, like they're zero or one essentially or whatever they are, you just add them up. So a simple linear model. Right, would be the simplest thing you can build. So he says, okay, well, let's, let's just like go off and now do some testing. So he, he got 96 x-rays, right? And he then made a copy of them all, by the way. He doubled them and mixed them up, which was a good way to, you know, this is like doubling the testing here. And then showed them to all these oncologists and got them to say, are they totally benign, slightly benign, not sure, probably cancerous, definitely cancerous, you know, on this scale. And then he got his results, right? Um, and his findings were kind of surprising. First of all, every oncologist contradicted himself at least once. Okay, because you got to get here, what was smart is he showed the oncologist the same x-ray twice, but in a random order. And every oncologist differently diagnosed significantly at least one of the x-rays, right? So even more significant, there was very little correlation or agreement among these guys. So one oncologist might say, you've definitely got cancer. And be, oh my God. And then another oncologist would say, no, it's fine. Right? On the same x-rays. That in itself, you know, might give you pause when you next go to the doctor, right? And secondly, the simple algorithm, the simple seven-factor weighted algorithm. No, we didn't even fit, right, by the way, the weights here or anything fancy. Did better than the best doctor. Right? Now... Question is, when was that study done? Does anyone know when that study was done? It's not on the slide. <coughs> uh, like last five years? Last 70s as a guess? What about the 80s? Anyone for the 80s? 90s? 90s, okay, very good. Anyone, okay, so we, I'm not, everyone's gonna be a bit cautious here. Got it, like we're, we're scientists. So the answer, it was done in, it was published in 1968. Right. Um, so it was published in 1968 um, and there was a result of a bunch of eight years of work. And there'd, there'd been a famous book in 1954 just about clinical psychologists where a, a guy who was a psychiatrist had basically just said, we are terrible. Like basically simple algorithms consistently do better at predicting whether someone will have a psychotic episode, whether they will come back into treatment. It's just like we, we he called it actuarial, it's just better. Uh, than almost every human expert diagnosis. I mean, even better things like even worse findings if you're a psychiatrist, like average, like first year students do as well as like 30 year experience 
psychiatrists at doing these diagnoses, right? Um, so there are hundreds of studies like this, which kind of, if you like, man versus simple models of man, the simple data-driven models do better than experts, right? There's now hundreds of these studies, and they're almost all consistent, at least in the areas they study, that they do better. I mean, predicting the outcomes of elections, you know, you name it, predicting the outcomes of football games, etc. Now, why? Why is that? I'm going to tell you there's three, I'm going to offer three reasons to you. So first of all, I told you I grew up on a farm, right? So I have this, this is a, a super secret fact that only I may know, which is that sheep can count to three, right? Um, so sheep basically can count one, two, and many. That's, that's kind of it. So for example, the reason I know this is as a kid, my mother had to explain to me that if a sheep, most sheep only have two lambs when they have, get, have you know, have, have babies. Um, but sometimes they have four, right? And she was always like, well, when they have four, you've really got to watch out because they won't know when they've lost a lamb. When they've got two lambs, they know when one of them's gone missing because they can count to two. But when they've got four, they're like, well, I just had many. I don't know whether it was three or four or whatever, and I just lose them. Now, before you think, my God, sheep are just so dumb, what do you think humans can count to? Without a counting system. Without the invention of a numerical counting system where you basically then count off against something in your head. <coughs> the same? It's pretty good. It's about six or seven. Right? Humans, if you, for example, just, if you don't have, if you didn't have language, you didn't have a counting system or a tally stick, or even I just throw, for example, pebbles on a table, you can count to about six, just kind of perceptually. Above that, you have to start counting off. Right? So there's just like, animals in general, they're phenomenal. We've got vision, you know, I can talk to you and stand up at the same time. You know, it's a big deal, that's not a trivial thing to do. You know, I can perceive that there's things outside. You know, humans are really powerful, incredible beings. But we weren't actually designed to do arithmetic. It's like not a hugely valuable thing, actually, evolutionary, to be able to count to a thousand. It's not, it doesn't give you a lot of evolutionary advantage to be able to count like that. It sometimes happens. Do you remember Rain Man? Has anyone seen Rain Man with Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman? He can count to like, there's 97 matchsticks on the ground. Certain people have actually that ability, but it's not a very useful ability generally. But now in this world where we have a lot more data and information, it's becoming more useful. But the point is that machines are very good at counting. Right? And that's something that is different from what humans can do. Uh, second, this is another this is another true story which is Jennifer was a woman she had a car accident on the Toronto interstate just outside of Toronto and she's taken to hospital to the emergency room and she presents the you know they x-rayed her she's got a load of broken bones she's had this frontal collision but one of the things that's worrying them is that she has an irregular heartbeat like it's da -da, da -da, and then very slow and then da -da 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 -da, and then it's like she has an irregular heartbeat and this is this is not good news right and they're like well what could this be so they they haven't spot anything, so they leaf through her notes very quickly, and they're like, ah, oh, she's got a thyroid problem. She's got an overactive thyroid, which is a gland, right, in your body. And one aspect of, of, of hyperthyroidism is a regular heartbeat. So the dogs go, great, okay, we don't need to worry about that, because it's not life-threatening. We can treat her later with some thyroid drugs. Let's get to work. And then one guy who's been trained in decision-making uh, at the hospital, he's actually now published a whole bunch of papers, a guy called Don Redelmeyer says, wait, we have a checklist process here. And we also have a thing where we need to stop when we're making decisions like this and think. Because humans build stories, right? Humans have what is called this kind of sense of representativeness. Um, for example, just weirdly, if I told you a family had boy, 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 and then girl, 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 right, three boys and then three girls, is that more, more likely than having boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl? Right? Now, the obvious, the correct answer is they're both equally likely. But many people think boy, 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 boy is much less likely, you know, girl, 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 is less likely than some kind of alternating. People have a sense of, like, what's kind of normal and representative. And at this moment, people have a story about Jennifer, which is that she's got a thyroid problem. Thyroid problems are associated with this irregular heartbeat. And that's, by default, would be a good diagnosis. But right now, she's just been in a frontal car accident. There could be a lot of other things. And so the doctors pause and they look harder. And what do they find? She had a fractured rib, 
that they hadn't spotted on the x-ray that had punctured her lung. And when you puncture the lung, that, can, that causes an irregular heartbeat. And they treat that without which she'd have died then and there. And the thing is about humans is therefore they have this thing where we get into stories about things, right? Where we get, we fit then our evidence, the story we have. We look for things that fit that. Um, and we make all kinds of cognitive biases. So this is this very, very famous paper by a guy called Tversky and Kahneman, which is a 74. It's really worth reading. It's really readable. And they talk about these kind of three heuristics. I, I could just tell you another one that you might love, right? Which is, imagine you all came in here for this talk and I gave you a piece of paper randomly with a high number between zero and 100 or a low number. So some of you got five or eight and some of you got like 94 or 90 or like 83 or something. And then I asked you to write down how many African countries are there in the United Nations? Right? There would be a significant difference between your estimates. The people who had a low number, for example, would estimate around 25 on average. The people who got a high number would estimate 45. I've simply given you a random number, and as a result of that, your prediction about something completely unrelated will be significantly anchored about what's going on. I mean, it's why you guys know advertising, right? It's why people tell you, not, you know, or, you know, you want to give people some number. It's like you're going to a business negotiation. You give them some nice high, you know, you want to have lots of numbers around that are really high. <laughs> or give them a really high number and then negotiate down, right? Um, it kind of anchors them. Um, availability. It's just easier, for example, if I ask you to think of words that begin with K and words that have K in the middle, right? In the English language, there are many more words that actually have K in the middle of them than have them at the beginning, but you can't recall them. The human mind is not good about searching for words with K in the middle, but we're good about thinking of words that begin with K at the, the start. Key. You know, but it will take you probably several seconds to think of one with K in the middle. So there's this aspect of like availability. We go to what's available. Um, and we just make loads of other great judgments. And one of the ones I really, really love is this, which is, it comes out in their paper, which is in the, in the Israeli war in 1973, when it, uh, the Arab, Arab uh, Israeli war, lots of Israeli pilots were getting shot down in one particular group. And the guy in charge of the group was like, my God, you know, should we pull them off of like, should we stop them flying? You know, what's going wrong? And they were like, listen, th this is just a tiny sample. Like they flew, they've flown like three missions and you've got a group of about 15 people. You can't statistically conclude any of that. And the nicest one of this, of course, is who knows what reversion to the mean is. Okay, so I've got a good one. So imagine, um, imagine, I just think of something, let's say you had a kid, right? And your kid does really, really, uh, really well on the test, like way better than normal on their school test, right? And you go, oh, well done, son, like Jason, you did so well, that's great. And the next time, he's back to average. You're like, you know what that teaches me? Just, you just don't want to reward him. And you think, and you think okay, so next time I'm going to try it out. Next time he doesn't do so well on the test. And you're like, Jason, that's it. No, no, you know, no TV after supper this week. That's it. Until you get better at your maths, no more TV. And guess what? The next time he goes out, he does way better. And you're like, yes. Punishment works, rewards don't. Now, why is that fundamentally flawed from a picture of human decision making? Because humans have, it. let's say there's, there's a mean, there's just how he's going to perform on average, your son, right? Well, when he does better, it's just likely that next time he's going to do worse because he's going to go back to his average performance, right? But you're now going to, you're going to reward him and then think, my God, I should never have rewarded him because he's got worse. And conversely, every time he does badly, it's just likely on average that next time he's going to do better. But you'll be like, oh my God, punishment really works. Right? And so there's a great phrase in their paper, because they're kind of Israeli, right? And kind of Israeli Jews are always pessim like kind of somewhat pessimistic about the world. They're like, you know, what this teaches us is that we will be consistently punished for rewarding people and rewarded for punishing them as human beings, even though it's untrue, right, at a psychological level. So there's these fundamental biases, and I think I've left the best one to last, right, on this one, which is, this is about a big deal. So you think Cambridge entrance exams matter. What about getting out of jail? This is decisions about whether you get parole. By the way, if you want to come in, there's some more space. There's a whole seat here. Come on, come on in. Um, this, this is about 
parole. So this is Israel, again, this is no coincidence here, by the way, with Tarnum and controversy, but just happened to be, this study was done in Israel. So this is, judges have to sit there and they have to decide, um, they have to decide whether someone's going to get parole. So whether someone's going to get let out of jail to go back with their family into the community or whatever. And the thing is, this is the proportion of favorable decisions. Because can everyone see them? On the left, basically this is zero to one, which is one means you definitely grant the parole. Zero means no cases got granted parole, right? It's percentages. So this means about 65% at the beginning, right? And this is on average, okay? And the thing around the bottom of the, the, the page is basically time during the day. Right. So at the beginning of the day, you come in if you're getting, so asking for parole and you come before the judge and the judge, there's about a 65 percent chance that you get parole on average. Because this was done over eight months, by the way, with about six different judges. So it's over a long period. So on average, you have a 65 percent chance you get parole. Now, the, the morning goes on and basically on average, by the time you hit about lunchtime, you have a zero percent chance of getting parole. Right. The judges go off for their meal break. OK, that's what happens. This is their meal break. They come back from their meal break and it's back to about 65 percent right and then it falls again till about basically the afternoon break when it's got back to about 10 percent and then it goes up again after they have their afternoon tea right and then it falls to zero at the end of the day right this you know and just to be clear this has been corrected for all the other variables you could like to think of this is just time during the day and it's basically the basic logic of this psychologically is that Particularly, by the way, granting parole is harder than not granting it. By default, if you don't grant parole, yeah, they stay in jail, but you know they can't go out and like rape a granny. Like there's this kind of psychological thing which is like, oh my god, I let them out, and something terrible happened, and it's my fault as a judge. So by default, you don't kind of you don't grant parole. I mean, by the, clearly, they grant parole most of the time, but just when it becomes stressful and when they're cognitively overloaded. So it's like, you know, you don't want to go to a business meeting where someone's gonna, some clients have to sign off a lot of money, like, before, just before they're about to eat. It's just a bad idea, right? Like, if you want one piece of advice. Yeah, you want to go, when people have to take big decisions, particularly one that may be potentially cognitively stressful, doesn't actually mean psychologically, but cognitively stressful, then you want to do it when people are, are kind of well. I mean, it's obvious. But humans, the thing I want to get is that this doesn't happen to machines. I hope that's obvious. Machines don't get tired in the same way. I mean, you know, they can wear out, but they don't, you know, over the morning suddenly decide, like, my oh, I'm just tired now. I'm just going to not predict so well anymore, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's time for a break. I need some more electricity, you know. Um, that doesn't happen. Now, the thing is, I want to mention about this is people have known this now. Those papers were published like 74. Um, they have filtered through and a lot of there's a really good book around this by Michael Lewis called The Undoing Project, which some of this is kind of borrowed from. But this this isn't accepted that much. So organizations don't do this. I mean, take Cambridge admissions. There's a huge amount of evidence, by the way, that actually interviewing people in person is actually bad. It may actually be bad for your decision making and hiring to actually interview people in person because you're overwhelmed by people being charming or not charming. People who are really charming, like you want to hire them, but it actually has very little correlation with their ability to do their job. In fact, it's probably more important to do interviews because people like to be interviewed, it turns out. Like they feel they're not valued in a hiring process if you don't interview them. Then for you as a way of discovering stuff, it's actually probably more misleading for you to interview people in person than the value it derives to the information gain. And particularly, by the way, it's even worse when they're big. Big people, by the way, we tend to be charmed even more by very tall people, right? Because, because part of it is just they're, they're big, right? So we want to be like nice to them, sort of, right? Go, there's something in us. So, you know, there you go. Um, so the thing is, though, people don't accept this. And I just want to mention this quickly. There are several reasons. People feel threatened, like kind of there's a sense of like, well, how can a machine be better than a human? There's an aspect where people feel threatened in their job, which is important for you guys to think about when you're talking with people. There's a simple sense of like, just kind of like, oh, you know, it can't, it kind of, it can't be so. And so I, you, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to mention that. So to summarize, the part two is going to be quicker, so we're going to be done in about another 10 minutes. Is data-driven algorithms are surprisingly good. They often perform better than human experts in areas ranging from forecasting outcome of football games to diagnosing cancer. And the reason is that humans operate for approximate heuristics and are not well adapted to these types of problems. Right. But, you know, we're great. Human beings are extraordinary, but we're just not really good at that. I mean, the simplest example I can think of is if you go to the supermarket 
You don't just kind of go, oh, I reckon that's 35 pounds of shopping. And the cashier goes, oh, no, I think it's 27 pounds. No, you have a machine that adds it up. Humans are not good at adding up 200, you know, five-digit numbers in their head. It's just not something we're well adapted for. Now, we remain well reluctant. So part two is I want to say, well, smart data. If data-driven decision-making is so great, how can we do more of it? And what are some of the challenges? So the kind of basic story is you want to do more of it. I want to add, though, you want to be smart about that. So I want to give you one story. Does anyone here read Borges? Borges, ever? If you can, you can look him up. He writes these really beautiful short stories. They're very short. You can read them over lunchtime. And he actually got the Nobel Prize for Literature as well, so he's good. And he was Argentinian. And he's got this story uh, called The Library of Babel. And it's this story about this library. And the library is made up of hexagonal rooms right, like a hexagon, and every room opens north, south, east, and west, and then on the other sides of the room it has shelves of books, and it also goes up and down, and as far as anyone could tell, the library maybe goes on forever. You can keep wandering through the rooms, and you can never get to the end of it. And just before the story opens, about 10 years before the story opens, the librarians in the library have had an incredible breakthrough, because the, book, the libraries are, the books are not of varying length, they're all 410 pages exactly. And what the librarians have discovered, they think, is that the book contains every book. Sorry, the library contains every book possible. Every 410 page book that you could possibly write is in that library. Right? And there are, um, this means the library is not infinite, by the way, which is a very good thing. But they're like overjoyed because what it means is inside the library is the answer to every question Does there exist a God? What is the purpose of life? What is the best thing to eat for breakfast? Right? All of those questions, somewhere in the library is a book with an answer. It's incredible, right? The, every human question we could have is there. But then suddenly, just around the time of the book, a very sad thought has come into existence. Go for it. Sorry. No, I'm no. Rolling. No, I'm... It's also true that the library, if it contains every truth, must also contain every falsehood. And it also contains every approximate truth. Just as it has every true book, it has every book which is a little bit true, but not quite. And there's no way to tell the difference. So there's been this despair has overwhelmed the librarians, right? And if you ever thought about big data, for example, this is a problem some of the clients may face. They, th they thought that just more was better. Whereas, of course, the challenge is when you have so much, for example, the more data you have for the data science around here, the more false correlations you have. The easier it is to get things that you think are predictions, but aren't. And in fact, if you really want to get technical, the set of correlations you can make within any given, they say it's like NP complete, like basically, basically the point is, you can generate a lot of correlations from data, and it gets worse the bigger it is, or the cursor limit. So the point of this story is that you want to be selective. You don't want to just go fishing anywhere. You want to have some purpose in your fishing. Yes, there is this great data sea out there, but you want to know where the good fishing grounds are. You want to know where maybe the kind of fish you're looking for are when you go and talk. Secondly, so it's kind of the point of that story is you want relevant data, not just big data. You want the data that actually addresses it. And sometimes that may just be a spreadsheet of data. Maybe it's megabytes, um, et cetera. Second up uh, is reliable. So Facebook, I don't know if you guys know, last September it came out that Facebook had misestimated their key video metric for two years, right? Now, um, in fact, by the way, this kind of one of the people I, uh, I, I'm involved in this company called Datopian, and you might have seen it at the very beginning, but one of my colleagues there um, has worked at Facebook. And you know, it's like, it's like, well, you know, it's not that Facebook are totally dumb, it's that, for example, going from clicks on a video, you know, on the video on the Facebook page to this metric on the advertisers page involves in like 600 different SQL query steps, you know, and different databases and, you know, and knowing Facebook, by the way, they have bought every technology. Perhaps they haven't bought Black Swan yet, but they seem to have bought probably every technology under the sun at some point. And most of them are in operation somewhere, you know. So it's a complete zoo. And so you have this question about reliable. So what was the impact of Facebook that tarnished brand, diminished trust, and significant internal costs of this kind of data engineering problem? And so the thing is, you want reliable data. How do you know when you see that metric or that prediction that it's actually what you think you're looking at? So for example, in this case, what it turned out is people thought they were looking at only video views of over three seconds, but they were looking at all video views. 
Any of you who've ever tried to communicate the design of a software problem to another coder or to another person will know how easy it is and hard and hard it is to be precise and easy it is for them to misunderstand what you're talking about. And that's just going to get more of an issue as we have more automated prediction. How do we actually know we're predicting what we think we're predicting? How do we know that the data we're looking at is actually the correct data? It's not stale data or it's not something we accidentally made an error in. So data quality will be very important. So if you like here is to say there's this incredible enthusiasm, this incredible opportunity of data-driven decision-making. But just curb your enthusiasm a little bit before you rush out and order your next big data toolkit, right? You want to order one, but order it that you can be hard to derive value from data than you might think. It's neither simple nor a solution for everything. And this is often what I would say, I wouldn't necessarily say in these talks, but I think Black Swan should say is this kind of, we're what kind of the smart data aspect pitch. You know, it's like, it's not just doing data, it's doing it smart. It's being, making sure you get ROI. It's being intelligent about the data we use. It's being kind of not trying to solve everything. It's knowing where to fish. We know where to fish. Those kind of things are quite important stories. Particularly as I imagine the client base you engage with increasingly have some, possibly some of those good, but also mixed experience of like, they have bought a data warehouse that's sitting there in the desert, pristine and beautiful, costing millions of dollars a year and producing absolutely zero business value. Right? They will, that experience will be there for people a little bit sometimes. And that's actually an opportunity to say, you're absolutely right. It takes skill and expertise to actually derive real business value for you from this. And we know how to do that because we've got all this experience and we also know how to be kind of smart about this data. So I kind of go the three R's, the right data for the right problem at the right, right time. Okay, and so I just want to end with a key point, which is, I, I guess, is this, which is the other aspect you have is this thing that decision makers will face, which is deep down this human desire of like, we're going to be supplanted. It's the future of the machines, right? Or even my job is at threat. That is going to be crucial. So I want to emphasize what I call the synthesis of this, which is that it was human doctors and decades of research that actually identified the seven features to look for in, in the stomach cancer. It was an algorithm. You had to know what to go looking for. And that took human intelligence. OK, it took humans or human built processes to collect that data. You have to still build and design those processes that collect the information you want and to design the algorithms. And also humans had to act on those predictions and insights. And if you like, I'll end with one final story, which is everyone knows what an ATM is, right? Does anyone know what ATM stands for? Automated teller machine, this man again, very good. And then someone over here, but perfect. Now, does anyone know what a teller was or is? Bank it's a bank clock. In the States, a teller was someone you went in and said, I'd like five fifty dollars please, and they would count out fifty dollars and debit it from your account. And back before there were ATMs in the 70s, this was a very large profession. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were actually bank tellers. Now, since the introduction of ATMs, what's happened to employment in that area, do you think? Has it gone down? Has it gone up? Or has it stayed the same? It's gone down, right? Well, in fact, well, it at least as describes a profession, it's actually gone up. Because while it's true they no longer do tellers, what those bank clerks became, or at least the category called that, is they moved into other value-added functions. They stopped basically handing out money, which is a very low-value exercise, and they got into advising you about loans or advising you about your mortgage. So in fact, if you look at least the, the line in the Census Bureau in the United States, that category of employment has actually gone up, even though that entire area of work has got replaced by a machine. So in general, in these kind of areas, there's huge opportunity out of these things to actually do more, to have more work or more activity in these organizations in using this insight and information. Um, so I would like to conclude by the suggestion, which is what you're really looking here is this kind of man and machine. The insight and value that we can derive from data can only be, happen when it's directed and combined with human intelligence. And that's what, in the sense, you guys are up to here. You're trying to see, to, to augment and support the incredible human intelligence in the organizations that you're working with, with stuff that can automate, can do the things that humans are not good about that can deal with the heuristics and biases we have and support that kind of decision making. But ultimately, it's a human who's going to have to act on whatever the prediction is or make a decision to act on it. Thank you very much.